We believe that wealth is a journey and that this is your jumpstart to trading success. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Trader's Mind Jet Show, where we believe that wealth is a journey and that this is going to be your jumpstart to trading success. I'm Mike. And I'm Melissa. And if you've always wondered how to streamline your trading process, we are joined today with a special guest, Evan Maderos. He's the founder of Trade Risk, and uh, which is a financial media company specializes in technical analysis and trading education. Um, but one of the cool things is that he actually started with a computer science background. So I'm so interested to see how he was able to take that and tie it in with his trading. Yeah, you know, the what, one of the things that's helping us to be more efficient uh, is having our development team on board now uh, with Stu uh, and and Medi building out the the trade gauntlet. It's it's those kind of technological um... innovations. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah th those kind of innovations. The writer in me, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's those kind of innovations that can help speed up the process. So it'll be really cool to see what Evan's up to. Uh, we we first met Evan uh, back in, what, what was it, 2003? 13, I think it was. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I was pregnant with Lily. Yes, I remember. I could I had to keep it a secret because it wasn't yet the at the um, three month mark. But yeah, it was so exciting. We got to meet him, and we went went out to dinner. I remember. So I was so mm -hmm. excited to find out what he's been up to. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things before we have Evan join us is to talk about how Mike here streamlines his trading yeah. process. I'm putting you on the spot. But to talk about like what what are ways that you save time? You mentioned the trade gone, but other ways that you are using innovation, and not just for what Mara is creating, but other things within your trading system yeah. that helps you um, streamline your trading process. Uh, you know, it's a great question. Uh, Anthony uh, in our Discord chat just brought up brought that question up. Uh, so for me, though, how it started way back when, uh, like thinking about the, the original IBD meetups, right? Like, like hearing how these full-time traders were uh, doing it a lot, like finding, uh, analyzing the market, building watch lists, uh, looking at XYZ, a couple of dozen variables, and, and trying to drill that down, right? So it, it, it can be overwhelming when you have so many different variables, you're trying to to narrow it down and how how can I make this efficient so I could still do it part time? I think that that's the answer that many of us are trying to get towards. Or even if you are trading full time, who doesn't want extra time in their day? Mm -hmm. So what I started to think about was how can I it's kind of reverse engineering uh, the process, starting with how much time do I want to spend on this? And then thinking about the different things that other people were using and then filtering it down into what are the bare essentials, right? And then it's, well, when, when you could see the bigger picture, you could start to see where there's um, overlap where there's redundancy, and then you can start to take out some of that redundancy. Um, you mentioned the bare essentials. Like, what are those bare essentials, and how do we figure that out as we're drilling this down? I think that the bare essentials uh, drills down into three main components, uh, and that this is going to be true for all traders, well, whether you're trading stocks, whether you're trading Forex, whether you're trading crypto, whatever. I think that it bo really does boil down to, uh, to these three things, right? So, so write it down. It's going to be uh, your position size, right? The, how much you're going to risk will equal uh, the market's mood, right? So the, the whatever you, uh, well, whatever you, you think about the market's mood, right? Like whatever goes into that. For me, it happens to be the major indexes and putting it on multiple time frames. Maybe you don't care about that at all. Maybe you know, what you care about has to do with uh, a more fundamental approach. Maybe it's looking, if you're in the crypto space, maybe you're analyzing a few of the major coins and then that's going to help determine what you should do with some of the, the smaller coins, uh, the, the altcoins. Um, same thing, similar with Forex. So it's going to be taking that broader picture perspective, that, that perspective that, and basically what, what it, it's trying to tell you is how good are the conditions for your trading methodology? That's what I'm saying, like the market move, what ultimately is it? You're trying to see like how to gauge 
its performance? It, you want to get a gauge of how much you should uh, uh, how much you should risk, and then uh, looking at your system is it uh, the way that I like to do it now? It's like a red, yellow, green system. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, right. So, so real simple. Uh, like if it's uh, if you're in a green condition, then that means that it this is a great market, and you should be putting on more risk and trading because the your chances of success are better. If you're in a yellow condition, then yeah, it, it's kind of, it, you should be putting money at risk, but it's so-so, like it could go either way. If it's a red condition, you either want to uh, not participate at all, or you're participating in a very small way. So that way, it, almost like, you know, like how you, when you're sitting at a, uh, at a traffic light and it's starting to turn green and like maybe you start to roll a little bit and then like it turns green and then people go, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like that. So like you're starting to roll just a little bit but it's a red condition you're not expecting uh anything great from the market kind of like brings me back to i always remember my uh, piano teacher always said when the light turns green to still wait because you never know when that asshole or idiot is going to go like <laughs> flying through the the red light to prevent an accident right exactly so uh, present day the market just moved from a red condition to a yellow condition i'm not going and flooring it, I put on a couple of test positions uh, today to see how they would do. So far, uh, three out of four of them are profitable. So, okay, starting to get a little bit more traction. We'll see what tomorrow brings. If those uh, new trades continue to go, then all right, maybe we are starting to move back into a green condition. But it, it's allowing that feedback from the market and taking other things into account. Again, it, you can put whatever you want into your green condition into your yellow condition into your red condition it doesn't really matter as much as what i'm doing well but you can have a green a yellow and a red and that's going to help you uh, figure out how aggressive or how light should i be uh right now okay so you mentioned so mark and mood what, what was the first one again it was... yeah so so you're basically working towards how much money should I put at risk? Yeah. Right. So that's the first part of the equation. Your position size. Position how much? Um, how much should I put at risk? Then that's going to equal the market smooth. That whole red green, light, yellow, green, red. light, yeah, yellow. red light, green light, one, two, three, <laughs> and times the trades grade. Well, for for a long time, I was just going based off of a numerical grade, like well, what I would get from the gauntlet. But now that like. Uh, having uh, gone through um, uh, the Trader Vault Summit, uh, where we heard uh, Mike Bellafiore and Austin Silver talk more about like their grades, a lot like letter grades, that got me thinking too. Uh, like a, to have it be a little bit simpler, where all right, these are your A trades, these are your B trades, these are your C trades, and it should look like a bell curve. So A is a perfect, uh, like it has everything that you want, as close to perfect as it could be. B is pretty average, like trades that you would still take. And C, like it, yeah, like it, it only has like the bare minimum. It's just passing. So you should be putting a little bit more risk, a little bit more uh, money, a uh, larger position size into an A trade than a C trade. Mm. Into an A trade than a B trade. That's part of the equation. But if it's a green condition and you have an A trade, then all right, let's go. You're never going all in like, like that, right? Like you never oh, like, chips uh, in all right, for like, like, all right let's craps. <laughs> mortgage the house, let's go. <laughs> no, it's never that, but your full position size on your best trade, like that's what's uh, giving you the confidence to say, all right, this is an A level trade. I analyzed the market's mood and it's green, great put on the most amount of risk. Oh, actually, looking at the market right now, it's a yellow condition and I've got this B level set up. Well, maybe I'll go a half size on this, test the waters. You know, like it's still a good idea. The market is kind of so-so, uh, let's, let's see. I love it. I think that this is a great tool that people could be able to analyze for their own trading as they're analyzing um, risk and how much they want to be investing in the market, especially since the market is so choppy right now to understand like what they're yeah. comfortable with. Yeah, well, like it, it's the market is uh, is complex, right? Like so there it's like a, playing a game where you get to make up the rules. So that's where uh, 
people get confused, right? Because you'll hear somebody talking、uh, on social media. They say one thing. You see somebody talking on CNBC, Fox Business, or whatever, and they're saying something completely else. And it's like, well, all these people have great ideas and opinions. Well, what do I go with? Well, if you have a clear way of defining, like. This is my definition for an A setup. This is my definition for a B setup. This is my definition for a C setup. Then, like you know, like what the、uh, what that is.、Mm -hmm. If you know what constitutes a green condition, a yellow condition,、uh, a red condition, that's clear as well. Then it becomes just like simple math of figuring out. Okay, I'm going to put on this much risk, and here's the reasons why, and. That you could sit there with that trade and be confident in it.、Uh, like the market's yellow right now, so I don't have great expectations for the、uh, the trades that I'm in. Like, yeah, I I put them on, so I'm expecting that they'll work. But it's not like, all right, this one's going to the moon. No, like my expectations are tempered because we're in that yellow environment. Now, if they start to ramp up, then great. Now we're starting to move to a green environment. If they start to fail in a green environment, then it's like okay, dial it back down. Now we're back to a yellow environment, and with that goes all the sizing, all the risk. So that way, you're putting your largest trades on in the best conditions, in the best A level trades, and you're scaling back when it's、uh, the worst conditions, when it's a red condition. This is amazing. I just love his passion. Like, if you love it, write it in the comments. Because, like, this is what Mara is all about. It's about like being able to teach something so complex that that can kind of go over your head sometimes, and making it so easy to understand. So, if you haven't already, check it out at MaraWealth.com. You get great coaches like Mike and, and Stu, as well as from other peers. And、um, I think this is great. And honestly, as you're talking about, I know we mentioned the last time. I would love for you to do a course. This might be the free course that you're looking to be putting out soon. So I think this is going to be help, be very helpful. All right, great. And for stay tuned because we have more incredible ways for you to be able to streamline your process for your trading.、Um, coming up right after this quick word from our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by the Mara Mindshift Guide, a trading beliefs workbook. Trading is a mental game. This workbook combines 20 years of trading experience with simple, easy-to-follow exercises to help you manage your mindset and move past limiting beliefs. Get your copy of the Mara Mindshift Guide today on Amazon or at marawealth.com/mindshift. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Traders Mindset Show. Uh, today we have an awesome guest, and a guest that、uh, I first met about seven years ago. Well, was it seven or was it eight years ago?、Uh, oh, it, man, yeah, could it? To be honest, I'm not sure. It was a long time ago. It was seven. <laughs> it was seven because、okay. I was pregnant at the、ah. time, so I remember. And Lily's now six. Oh my god, crazy! Moses has got the facts. There you go. So <laughs> seven years ago,、uh, our guest、uh, Evan Medeiros、uh, and I and Melissa too. Well, we were all in、uh, Coronado,、uh, California. The,、uh, you're not familiar. It's right by San Diego. It's gorgeous, and、uh, we were there for Stocktoberfest.、Uh, young guys, lots of hopes and dreams, and here we are, many. Many years later,、uh, a few、uh, few more gray hairs on my side.、Uh, Evan looks awesome, and、uh, that dude. It's great to talk to you again. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I'm still I'm still dreaming too from those times、uh, seven eight years ago. So that's that's good.、Uh, but yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to、uh, do this little power hour with you guys. Absolutely.、Um, uh, can you give us、uh, the rundown on, on the, some of the big projects that you have going on?、Uh, like, oh, well, wow, what's、uh, what's good in your world, man? Tell us all about it. All right. So yeah, I mean, so I'm a trader first and foremost, kind of full time, and、mm -hmm. I also have the Trade Risk website business, and we do a lot of different things there. So. Trading for me is mostly automated at this point. I know that's probably the heart of this conversation that we're going to talk about, but my systems basically are running right now. Hopefully, they're doing things、uh, responsibly and as they should.、Uh, but they are basically kind of running the show for most of my most of my accounts, basically. And so、mm -hmm. that leaves me time to do webinars like this, post content, 
do a lot of testing, back testing and writing code. So a lot of the kind of behind the scenes stuff. And I mean, in terms of projects, I mean, we run automated systems. So I'm always kind of tinkering and building systems and thinking about different ideas. And I do a lot with Warden TC2000. So that is a charting platform for those of you who are not familiar. They've been around for ages. I think they were telecharts back in the day, certainly in the 90s, I think when they really started to come up. And so I do a lot of coding for traders there and uh, produce different guides, walkthroughs, tutorials, things like that. So yeah, that's that's kind of uh, what's on the uh, what's on the plate. Ah, very cool. Uh, I, I'd love to talk more about some of the these automated systems. We were talking a little bit about um, efficiency earlier. It's been a uh, a hot topic in our Discord chat. Well, what are some of the things that you look to uh, like? Like at this point, like you sounds like you've automated the whole process. Uh, like, well, what? Uh, can you walk us through some of like the, like what goes into that thought process? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe start there. Sure, sure. So yeah, the the history behind it, just to hope, you know, bring it up is, is I used to be a hundred percent discretionary, you know, shoot by the hip type of trader. I mean, I would open up my charts, look for the ideas, follow the news flow and really just get at it and trade. And I did that for a long time. And that's how I started. And basically every year, basically every year that went by, I traded a little bit less and I sort of automated or I put more structure each and every year. Right. So it was this, it was this, this theme in my sort of background and progression as a trader is that I was just slowly kind of building the structure around. And so when I say like, I have, you know, fully automated systems now, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, it's not a, you know, snap the fingers here they are. I mean, it took, you know, it was a decade plus in the making of slowly, but surely just building out more and more rules until I ba basically automated myself out of it and, and, you know, removed myself. Evan was no longer needed from the decision-making process. So the way I like to think of it, there are, there are a few like key core building blocks when I talk about uh, to traders about this and and the first thing and i think this is the first thing that i did and i know you know michael you you have this on your site too in, in position size it is is yes. just like a is is an initial thing that's low hanging fruit is super important that i think everybody could certainly start with so if you're looking if you're if you're out there you're a discretionary trader you know you want to automate more you want to go down this process of streamlining your trading start with position size if you're if you don't have a, you know, it can be a simple calculator, just a simple Excel based calculator. But if, if you don't have something that is, you know, precisely telling you how many shares that you should be buying of this particular setup that you're looking at, that is the low hanging fruit you start with. Because if you're, you know, if you're trading things and you're saying, okay, hundred shares, this sounds good. I'm going to try and get a few dollars out of it. And then you're looking at another ticker symbol and, you know, oh, you know, 300 shares, cause it's half the price. I'm just going to do it that way. You know, if, if those are the numbers, if that's the thinking behind it, or if the lack of thinking behind it, uh, and I mean, mean that in a, you know, good constructive way, then that's where you should start. So lots of things can go into, into position sizing. You can keep things very simple based, basically always asking yourself where you're going to exit the trade and kind of thinking about, okay, well, how much do I want to risk if, if I'm buying here and I have to exit down here and I only want to risk 1% of my account? Well, that, you know, I can only take 33 shares or what, you know, whatever that number is, but then you can get more sophisticated and you can start to think like, Hey, I should incorporate volatility. I should incorporate correlations to these other positions I have on or what the market's doing. So you can make it more advanced, but I think that is a good starting block. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, and you know, if, if, you know, as you sort of graduate from there. So, so if you have that, that's something that saves you time and hopefully improves your trading. It, it keeps, it keeps you, you know, risking and, and keeping things apples to apples, right? You, you mm -hmm. know, you don't really as traders is sort of a debatable topic, but you don't necessarily want one position to drive the whole return, right? You, you, you want to make sure you're, you're kind of out there taking even risk. And again, that's a little debatable because, you know, it's sometimes okay to have concentrated positions and all, but I think that's a good first step. Um, and that's kind of the first thing right. that I did. I was like, literally the first, you know, kind of thing that saved me some mental space as small as that was making sure I could 
always knew exactly how many shares I should be buying, you know, to sleep easy at night. That was the very first thing I automated. Okay. Interesting. Um, that yeah. Let, let me ask you this, uh, like just to make sure that that I'm understanding it the uh, the right way. So, like, I, I have my own position size calculator. Uh, throw in the your your level of capital, put in your entry price, put in your stop loss, and uh, the percentage that you want to risk. It's telling me based on that buy X amount of shares. That's basically what we have here, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that level. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um... So yeah, that, that, that I think is, is great. I mean, that I think is great. I, I think it, so then it, it kind of gets into strategy specific. So there's a couple of other, I don't know, I don't know if more advanced is the right word, but just more um, nuanced. So I guess like, okay. yeah, volatility uh, of the actual instrument. So thinking about what the historical volatility of that stock is. So, you know, sometimes I like to say, you know, as a swing trader, for instance, I would love to, you know, go buy the spies today uh, at, you know, $420 is what they're trading at and, and put a, a one point stop loss in there and try and get it to 440, right? Like, I'd love to have some tight overnight stop loss, but realistically, that doesn't make sense because it's good in theory to have a one point stop loss. You know, it, it's, it's nice to think like, oh, I'll just get out at one point. But if I hold that position overnight tomorrow, we could see the spy open at like, I don't know what four, 400, it could, it could be down, you know, 380, it could be a 1% move. So my well-intentioned one point stop loss didn't actually, you know, serve me too well. Cause it wasn't, mm. it wasn't in the context of the historical volatility. So if I actually looked at the spies, you know, volatility over the past, year, I would say like, oh, you know, actually this thing can gap like, you know, a, a full percent on the day or even more. So I need to take that into consideration when I am constructing this trade. It is not only where I want to exit, but it's also thinking about what the behavior of that particular instrument stock ETF is. Um, so that's one way to maybe kind of push it to a, another level. And then maybe another thing would be correlations that sometimes is it depends on the strategy and trader because some people like to have tight, you know, heavily concentrated portfolios. But, you know, if I own Netflix, Google, Apple, Amazon, I may not need Facebook, right? Like it, it might not be a good idea to add something else that's going to trade identically more or less to my portfolio. Um, that mm. could be a risk violation, so to speak. So there are, you know, kind of a couple of other little, you know, tweaks, twists like that, that is just going to vary, I think, depending on, you know, the trader. Mm. So it, let's say, well, like I, I'm somebody I'm watching uh, and it's like, this sounds amazing. I have absolutely no clue how to code anything like, oh, well, well, well what, what should they do? Well, I mean, I think Microsoft Excel, that's honestly the place that I started. And in fact, I mean, I have, you know, the position size calculator that we have on our website uses Microsoft Excel and Google Docs. So, I mean, it would require, I guess, that you have a little bit of experience just, you know, kind of setting things up there. But I don't think it needs to be an entire sort of, you know, coding, um, you know, course that you need to take to, to put this into Python or, or C Sharp or anything like that. So I think you can start pretty basic. And again, everybody's got to sort of think to now and like look, reflect on their strategy and just think about what they actually need. Like, what is it that they actually need? Um, depending on how in depth you, you know, you really need that calculator. So I would say, keep it simple on like the Microsoft Excel. I would check out, you know, the resources you have on your site for the position size calculator. We have ours and yeah, that's kind of the way I would think about it. <sighs> Super interesting stuff, uh, and uh, uh, well, we're recording this live, so uh, there's people watching it on YouTube later on. Anybody that, that's with us now, like as you have questions, please like throw them down into the comments section, into the Q and A. Uh, Melissa is monitoring that; she's going to be firing out the the best questions that you have as we go along. Uh, that this is great so far. So we've got like how to start to structure the automation of position size. Yes. There's a lot more that goes into trading than position size. Well, well, what was the next thing that you started to look to automate? Like, are you, are you even like automating selection or is that like, you know, there's some manual 
element to it right like where uh, kind of like where you're driving a car and you know a lot like you can have the auto shift versus like the gear shift or or you're you're elon and you're just you know like getting in and it's taking you to where you need to go like well where are we at systems for, for me the systems are taking me where i need to go so actually i have zero input on anything at this point so that tr you know the trade selection um is definitely something that's the bigger piece to it. The next, I mean, the next thing I automated though, in terms of like the progression after position size was, yeah. and it's, I know it's something that you, again, um, you know, kind of hold dearly and talk, to, talk about is, is market environment and, mm -hmm. and just sizing up the market. And so for me, as I was sort of progressing, <clears throat> excuse me, I thought about the ideal envi environments that I want to be trading, that I found the most success in. And again, I think everyone is obviously going to have to reflect on how they're trading. Are they intraday? Are they swing trading? Are they position trading? It could be very, very simple here. And it could be like, I just want to see a market. I want to see an S&P, a NASDAQ, and a Russell 2000, throw the Dow in there, that, are, that is above a rising 50-day moving average. That could be it. That I mean, that, that might be all you need to, to, to mm. think about this. But obviously we could then go down this rabbit hole and say like, okay, well, we can look at how many sectors are participating. What's market breadth look like? What's volatility doing? What are the bond market, you know, telling, you know, so there's, this could go pretty complex in terms of a market environment sort of dashboard or, or filter or automation piece. But that was super helpful to me to self sort of identify what's, my best environment what's my a plus setups where should i be participating and that was kind of the next thing that doesn't quite go down to the to the trade setup side of things yet but certainly was an important top level filter for me ah interesting so yeah after that uh once i had that in place then i started to think more about the actual trade setups and the actual criteria that i was using to enter into a trade. And so for me, that started with just very targeted scans, uh, scanning the market real time, real time or after the market closes for the next day. And so really starting to only look at stocks that met the actual conditions that I was really looking for. And this sounds so kind of simple or basic or intuitive, but again, my perspective coming in as a new trader was like, let's just open up the market, stare at some charts and find something to trade. Right. And that's, that's a dangerous way to do it because you're always going to be able to find a trade, right? If you look at the market long enough, you're going to, we're all, especially as traders, right? What do we do? We trade. So like, if we're looking at a market, I can find a trade to take, but it's probably one I shouldn't be taking, or maybe, you know, maybe it's not one I have a full articulated plan for. So that's what made it dangerous. Um, mm. so for me, it was our take, it was, it was actually getting the scan sort of set up and the criteria built out. And then this all sort of pyramids together because it only, it had to fit within the market environment that I also wanted to, right? So first it was, okay, what's the market environment tell me? And if that's not right, then I don't even have any business scanning because there's nothing for me to do. Um, so yeah, this, this trade setups were the big one, um, on the next sort of pillar. Oh, interesting. How, how much, how many more pillars are there beyond? Uh... So, you know, the last one, which was the hardest one, so to speak, is, and I mean, so trade setups and uh, watch list building is kind of, I, I glossed over sort of the watch list building, but there, there's kind of two components of the trade setups. Essentially, you could think about curating the list of stocks you want to trade as being a very important part of the trade setup criteria. And that's kind of the way I do like to think about it. If I think about kind of this, this top level down approach, it's market environment first. It's then having a qualified list of stocks to trade. Then it's the actual trade setups. Then it goes into the position sizing algorithms. You can think of all these little tools kind of building out this process to help you streamline your trading. The last part of this process is the trade management, which can be the hardest mm. thing to automate or to be happy with, or to certainly to let go of is to finally say like, okay, I'm just going to let, I'm going to let this system 
do its thing. And I'm not going to agonize over all of the little details on, you know, what the candle closed or what this looked like and all that stuff. Let the system do it and, you know, automate that process. And so this goes into the much bigger conversation too of, you know, back testing and looking at different ideas and testing assumptions and looking at past trades. Like it sounds, you know, it's, it's all very, you know, high level sounds good and simple, but there's obviously lots of depth to kind of each of these things, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. How, how many trades did you test uh, for it, for each system? Like, yeah. So in the, like thousands or like, uh, I mean, definitely in the thousands. I mean, so I am, uh, you know, the systems that I run are kind of slower paced swing trading systems. So they're not, they're not, um, you know, they're not a high frequency turnover day trading system. So there's not, there's not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but there's definitely thousands of trades. And, you know, I do have the benefit of, of a computer science background. So I know how to code. I know how to kind of get my hands dirty and doing a lot of these tests. And I fully, you know, understand that this is a roadblock for a lot of traders is if you, you know, don't have the, the skills or time to, to get in there and really sort of test a lot of these things, it can, you know, this is a roadblock, this can be problematic, but for me, what I basically did was just look at the numbers, look at the data. I looked at the trades I was taking. I looked at the rules that I was, I was making and, and uh, you know, putting my assumptions behind as a discretionary trader. And then I just started to test them and say, okay, well, what does this actually look like if I ran it over the past 20 years worth of trading? What were my results have been? Would I have been happy? And that process was, yeah, very enlightening to see, oh, you know, there's, there's better ways to do things. There are um, setups I should not be trading that maybe I was trading in, you know, for instance, I used to trade like five or six different setups. I mean, three of them were dead weight. I mean, three of them were like break even at best. And, and again, this is, this is a big conversation of like back testing. I do not think like back testing is like the Holy grail and just the solving of all answers. It definitely has limitations, but there's information you can sort of learn from back testing essentially. And so, yeah, going through that iterative process and sort of testing the trades I was making, the assumptions I was making and refining it to a automated system that, um, is basically running today. Um, yeah. Evan, I have to, you know, interject here because I can't sure. imagine that first time when you finally said, okay, I'm going to remove Evan from this process. Were you still watching to see if everything was still working or did you do like half and half of your portfolio to kind of see like how it would work if you were fully removed? Because I feel like that the control to, for a lot of people to relinquish that control is probably a really hard thing to do. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. And one of the one of the benefits I had, and and it sounds so daunting, but because it was a ten year process, I was slowly removing myself. Basically, every you know, you could say every day, but like certainly every year, I was slowly doing a little bit less. And so, the the end was definitely kind of ripping off that last you know piece of the band aid. But I was sort of comfortable with the fact that like. I was, I was giving up control very slowly over this time and, and things were just fine, right? The world still went on and markets opened and I traded and the account was going, you know, generally in the right direction. So, so that gave me sort of the confidence and helped me not freak out, but yeah, it's definitely scary. And I still, so basically the way I kind of run my trading systems now is I see all the output. So all of my systems are basically swing trading or swinger position trading systems. So basically after the market closes, all my, uh, my system just runs through all the market data. It crunches everything that happened this week, or I'm um, sorry, this day in, in the market. And then it spits out essentially orders and trade management for the next day. And so every day after the market closes, I basically click a button, it runs through all of its 
its business of looking at markets and then it produces all the orders for me. And then I just manually, so I see all those orders and then I just click one button to basically submit them all automatically to my broker. But I, I get one little, and I never make changes to it, but I get to at least just make sure, okay, everything's behaving just in case, you know, anything wild happens with market data or if the system wants to, I don't know, buy, you know, a million shares of a one cent stock. I mean, it wouldn't do that, but like in case there's any edge cases that are weird, I just want to make sure I manually inspect it and then off it goes. So yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the approach that I've taken, but yeah, it's a good question. Interesting. Does it, does it ever go off the, the rails at any point? Like, is there some kind of like an event lot like last year, right? Like that, that's kind of a huge anomaly. Like go, yeah. can, can you talk a little bit about it or? Yeah. So yeah, that it is, it's a great, um, in fact, I had just put one of my systems online. It had only been trading like fully by itself for like four months when March, February, March came around of 2020, which was the height of coronavirus and everything sort of melting down. Um, that was a hell of a stress test for the system. And so, yeah, I was definitely sort of worried and looking at this and saying, this, and this is, this goes back to why backtesting itself is not a, you know, it's not the magical silver bullet because who, who could have predicted coronavirus, right? Who could have predicted mm -hmm. the fastest drop from all time highs to, you know, uh, bear market territory, 25% correction in, you know, in history, right? We, we couldn't, the back test wouldn't have seen it. So that's why when you get shocks like that period, it's an interesting data point. It, it shows how robust your system is and what it, what it tells you is, and it doesn't matter if you lost money or not, but I mean, as long as it lost money within the bounds of it, what it kind of should, or what it's kind of allowed to lose. And that's totally mm -hmm. fine. That's like a huge win because the fact that my system could survive a, you know, kind of exogenous event like that was something I came out of it saying like, okay, that hurt. I lost money because I was long stocks going into that. So yeah, that I felt it, but, mm -hmm. um, it came out and, and, you know, when I looked at the, the stop losses, it took, everything was normal. Everything was, yeah, that's how it should have been. That's how it should have acted. And I, and I got to essentially put a big check mark on that system that came out of that period doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Nothing broke, nothing melted down. The biggest problem I had, which was not the system. I mean, it's just exchanges. It goes to show you how brittle sometimes maybe markets are in general was I had orders to get out of positions in the morning, basically the system saying, okay, let's get out of this time to exit right at the open um, the next day. And a couple of days when we kept hitting circuit breakers and there were basically no markets made for some of these stocks. Some of these stocks are maybe a little bit thinner. They're not, they're not extremely thin by any stretch, but things that are a little bit thinner that basically there was no market that was being made at the open. So I, I have orders in to sell and I, they're just sitting there and, and I can't get out of a position. And, and that part was a little scary, but that's, that's market stuff. That's market structure stuff. That's not mm. necessarily my, my system. So yeah. Ah, interesting. Well, has, would you adjust it to the trade more liquid stocks? Like, is that something that that data is like, oh, like maybe I should uh, go for a higher liquidity or is it like, yeah, like the, this is it, this is still awesome. This is like such a far outlier that I'm willing to accept that. Yeah. I, you know, basically I'm willing to accept that. I mean, ultimately, okay. Yeah. Ultimately nothing, you know, I ended up getting out of all those stocks fine, but it was just this weird brief moment of like where, you know, when I'm just sitting there kind of in a lapse matrix type of thing, looking around like, okay, I got a sell order to, I got a marketable sell order and it's just sitting there. So, but no, I mean, nothing, nothing materially changed. And yeah, I try not to make too many changes at all to the systems. Very, very slow and deliberate in making changes. Um, that's kind of the philosophy there. Well, that's fantastic. It's uh, like you have a, a like, you know, it's like a second version of you, like standing there, like that, that's like completely rules based is going to do exactly well, what it's supposed to do. And, and, and you could trust it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the fact that, yeah, I, I sort of made it, it's an extension of me. I think that is the, definitely the appropriate way to think about it. And I mean, you know, um, 
the beauty is, is it's going to execute with no emotional, you yes. know, baggage or anything. That is totally the benefit. Um, the the hangup I think a lot of traders can get in this type of approach is it's not going to be perfect. Um, it, the way I like to think about it is a discretionary trader, a discretionary trader that has their mental game really in check, right? Which is something I know you focus on a tremendous amount. The, mm -hmm. a, a, a trader that has just great clarity, they are not compromised and they're running at you know high octane efficiency. I mean, if they can interpret real market data, if they can recognize, oh my God, you know, in, in last year's example, again, this is a, this is something we've never seen before. This is a shock. Liquidity is going to dry up. We've got, you know, everything about to lock down. I mean, obviously it's hard to have that foresight, but if you can understand the circumstances, you could react quicker. Maybe you're getting out day one and two versus my system that might be giving it the more room because that's what the rules say, but the system doesn't know mm -hmm. that this is a really new kind of wild circumstance, right? So, so there are, you know, the, I, you know, the discretionary trader, I think, again, it's to their own, the discretion, the intuition, the gut feeling, it's just, it's re it can be really good, but it, it's also the, the double-edged sword of, Hey, I didn't get enough sleep last night, or I got into an argument with uh, my partner or I, you know, and I'm upset and I'm trading or I'm revenge trading. And then that's obvious, you know, that's the spiral of the downside yeah. of the discretionary trader, of course. Yeah, it takes a, a long time to really develop your gut and to be able to differentiate between uh, a gut feeling that's uh, more from your experience. Well, when you're in a, a great positive trading state versus uh, an emotion that's uh, driven by fear or or greed or, or overconfidence, uh, yep. you know, yeah, it's... Um, it's really interesting. I, I, I use gut feel uh, as an important part of my trading, but it's one part. It, it's one part of, of a larger puzzle. And uh, so like, yeah, like I'm checking myself out with, uh, with other software, but the, this sounds really amazing uh, that it's, you, you know, like, it, it, yeah, it's, automating the process and you're able to take step away and allow this thing to run like who doesn't want uh more time back in their day exactly it's incredible yeah, yeah Evan, i have mean, a question for you oh, yeah. for, for the the trader um what still brings you the fun part of trading if now that it's automated i know a lot of traders trade basically they want to do this themselves because mm -hmm. it's not it's not it's a challenge mm -hmm. and it, it's fun for them to do this so where is that fun part for you is it in creating more software or, or watching this grow? Yeah. So there are two places that the, the fun still very much comes from. And the first is actually building the strategy. And I know it's so, I know it's, it's such a nerdy, you know, thing like, but like putting the code together, coming up with an idea, putting it into code, you know, looking at the results and then trying to get something in action. Like it is, it is actually extremely rewarding to sort of build something from scratch that, you know, can then be deployed and, and, you know, make some money. And so for me, the, 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 the research is still very exciting to me and um, the building of it. And number two is, look, I think the, the far majority of my capital of my funds are with my automated systems, but I still have a side account that I'll have some fun with, right? Like I, I'm, because I do think, you know, um, I do think you still want to trade. You still, like Mike said, want to get that gut feeling check reaction because that helps inspire me for other trading systems, right? So if I'm not trading myself, so again, it's, it's going to be a smaller account. It's going to be just something I'm, again, I'm not day trading or doing anything crazy with it, but I'm still putting on positions. I'm still trading and acting as a human with a smaller amount of money to then, you know, potentially even say like, oh, okay, that's actually a good idea, or that's a different way to think about it. Or, oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting that gut feeling. Maybe this is something I need to think about incorporating into a new system or update. So that's kind of the two places that I get the the, the joy and excitement nowadays. Do you ever compete against yourself <laughs> or against the system? Yeah. Um, you know, I actually was, I, it's funny. It was just the other day. I was like, you know, I need to put a spreadsheet together on my, uh, one of my accounts that I am trading myself versus my system and actually see how things stack up. So 
Yeah, it's actually something I'm about to do. I, I don't have any results, but it would Keep be kind of funny. Keep us updated. That's that, so interesting. <laughs> I love it. That, that'd probably be a good content series, right? Like human versus trader. Or like you're just, <laughs> you're trading against yourself type of thing. So yeah, that'd be kind of funny. You're guaranteed to win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh my goodness. Um, so... Well, we wanted to to give it to we wanted to sum it up it to give people like three ways to start trading more efficiently. Uh, like, well, what? Uh, like, well, we've got position sizing. That that's the the first thing that people should start to automate. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, you we started to look at other things out like adding volatility and correlations. Uh, well, well, what's like the broad buckets that that you think about? like is it? Uh, Position size, market environment, and setups are the the three. Yeah, I think so. I think it's. Um, I mean, you you know, the alternative is you could kind of lump um, like building a watch list and setups together, and then the last piece is the trade management side of of the it being a, a, a way to streamline. So you got position size, you got market environment. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's three or four, I guess, depending on how you want to cut it. But, you know, one of the one of the key like messages I always try and remember when I talk about this topic, too, is that for discretionary traders that are that are really kind of doing this themselves and, and look, you know, looking at charts, making all the decisions, whatever your edge is, and I know it's a hard thing to sort of kind of high level say, but like, whatever you're doing really well at, if you're really good at finding entries in stocks, for instance, you can catch those turning points or you catch those breakouts early or whatever, whatever it is, if that's something you're doing well, then don't automate it. I mean, if it's working, don't, don't, you know, don't, you don't have to fix anything, right? If that's a good thing for you, you enjoy doing it, you're good at that piece, then you should focus on automating something maybe you're not so good at. So maybe that's the trade management. Maybe you're really good at getting into trades, but you have no idea. It's hard to sell them. You don't, you give too bad, too mm. much back, or you're letting things just move too much. If, if that's your weak spot, then that is probably where you should attack with some automation and with some rules is just a less fancy way to say automation is just get some hard discipline rules and I think that's like an important takeaway. I don't think everyone needs to turn into robots. I think we just want to be thoughtful about how you could streamline your process. What are your weak spots and what could you reclaim some time back? And that's kind of the way I like to think about it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Melissa, well, what kind of, uh, what questions do we have from the audience? I see the, the Q and A box starting to get lit up. I agree. Yeah, we have a question from uh, Petru uh, who asks about drawdowns. When the system does not work, can you get into automatic big drawdowns or does the system need your decision to stop it or does it just stop itself? Yeah, so this is one of the, you know, this is a big topic in the, in the kind of quant systems trading sort of uh, realm is like, when do you stop trading a system? Um, so for me, this is where back tests are super helpful because when you back test a system, the back test is only telling you how that system performed historically. It's not, it's not guaranteeing how it's going to perform in the future, right? It's not a, it's not a crystal ball. It doesn't unfortunately translate one to one, but what it does is it, if you're running a back test over, so when I, when I build systems, I am usually back testing with as much data I can get my hands on usually back to at least 20 years worth of data. I'm going back 20, 30 years, trying to get into the nineties, just to see how things are performing during these different market environments. That's the key there is that if I've seen, for instance, during the dot-com crash, this system had a 20% drawdown in 2007 or eight, it had a, you know, 24% drawdown back in 2012, it had an 18% drawdown. Okay. So I like, so now I know like, okay, so it's got about a 20% drawdown going into coronavirus last year. If my system has a 20% drawdown, that's normal. Like that there's nothing wrong with that system there. It just, it went through a drawdown and we've seen it, you know, I've got the data to show like, okay, this has done it seven more times. It's going to do it seven more times in the next five years. Like this is the price I pay or this is the price we pay as traders is that sometimes things aren't going to go well, or sometimes we just have to take some losses. Our system is not in sync with what the market environment's doing. 
And so that's just the, the, the price of admission to, you know, generating 15, 20, 25, 30%, whatever returns per year is that drawdown. So that's the way I like to look at it is if now, you know, if my system drew down 60% in last year or something way off the charts, then I need to seriously look at my system and say, okay, there's something I did not account for, or something is wrong with risk management. This is not what I was expecting. This is not what I signed up for. So that's kind of the way I like to look at it. And uh, no, no intervention by me needed for the systems. They will, they will take their drawdown and then they will hopefully climb right back up and, and, you know, go on to, to do well. Oh, that's great. Uh, Dave yeah, so has a question. I know you mentioned a lot about back testing. So I know he wants to know about if you are spending any time doing research for market conditions, business sizing, journaling, um, in, I guess, the current state of the market. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you are doing, especially after what happened with COVID and being a little unprepared for that? Are you looking still at our current situation of where, where things are heading? Or are you still just letting the system do its thing, wait for a certain amount of time based on the back testing results to make any tweaks? Yeah, so I am very slow to make adjustments because if I've got 20 years worth of data or 30 years worth of, of testing data results that are telling me this is how the system performs, in the next six months, if something, I don't know, if something changes a little bit or, or if, I'm, if I'm fixated on six months and I'm ignoring the 20 years plus, that's where I think traders get can get just mixed up or start mm. to over over update their system. Um, my belief is, you know, trading is hard, right? Trading is really hard and building systems is extremely hard. There's lots of little traps you can fall in. The old joke is like, nobody ever sees a bad back test, right? Cause who's going to trade a bad back test? Like everybody's back test always looks great. That's, that's the, that's the, you know, the, the, the lure sometimes of, of building systems. I like to build systems that are not trying to be exact that are a little bit messy around the edges. And I know that's not like a comfortable thing to say, but they're trying to just generally stay with the market, right? They're trying to generally capture trends or they're trying to generally capture bounces, whatever they're trying to do. When you start to get very complex systems that are trying to just really like bottom tick things and get super advanced and get super nuanced, that is where things blow up because when things get too complex and you have conditions that rely on other conditions that rely on other conditions, when an unforeseen initial, you know, condition comes in, it, it just throws out your whole chain. And that's where you can get some crazy things happening, you know, uh, during these market shocks, so to speak. So I like to keep things kind of general purpose and, 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 you know, um, participate, catch those big moves, step aside during the, you know, the, the, the big volatility. And that keeps me, you know, kind of, uh, help, helps produce robust systems that I can kind of believe in and not have to go in there and over adjust and over adjust. There's one, there's basically one change I'm thinking of making to the system and it's a relatively minor change, but I've been sitting on it for about a year and I've been thinking about it and I've been looking at it. I've thought about this change, you know, 12 months ago, and I'm still just looking at it. I'm making sure it's the right change to make. And it's not me trying to overfit and overanalyze things. And, you know, ultimately it's a small change, but I just want to be very mindful of that basically. Yeah. Are you able to let the cat out of the bag? <laughs> um, it's around, it's around entries actually, which I know is always something everybody likes to talk about. Um, just the way uh, the, the system actually enters the trade and most of the systems that I have, so the two systems I have in production right now, they are actually very uncomfortable systems to trade as a human uh, because they are generally entering while markets are doing poorly or while they are in downtrends, so to speak. And it's counterintuitive and that can be very uncomfortable mm. for traders to trade is like something is selling off and then the system says, okay, you're going to buy it. And then you're looking at the chart and you're saying, well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't look like what, what I necessarily want it to do. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not trying to buy, you know, crazy falling night. It's not buying anything totally, you know, wild, mm. but I mean, 
it's at least buying things where it looks a little maybe unsettled to the traditional technical analysis crowd. It's going to look a little like, uh, I don't know about that one. Um, and so it's actually, you know, the change I'm thinking of making is actually going to make it slightly more conservative. So a little bit more on the tighter on the risk management. What I, what I suspect it's going to do is it's going to reduce the number of trades I take and probably increase my win rate by a little bit. So it's going to make the system on paper look a little bit better, but because it's taking fewer trades, I actually think the system might end up producing at the end of the year, a little bit less because it took less trades. So that's the trade-off is like, do I want to sacrifice net pro total net profit for slightly less drawdown, slightly better risk management, so on and so forth. So that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of the, you know, that's one of the changes I'm thinking of making anyway. Super interesting. Do you develop systems for other people to use too, or all these uh, like proprietary for yourself uh, and for your members? Yeah, I, I, it's a lot of work to, to build systems and to do that. I mean, it just takes so much time. And so I don't do it for, I don't build the full turnkey systems for anybody, but I do do a lot of coding and building of trade setups of like just the specific setup for TC2000. So I, I'm kind of an exclusive developer at this point. I used to develop on all kinds of stuff, but it's just too hard and it takes up too much of my, of my time. So unfortunately I kind of narrowed down to just, you know, if you're a Warden TC2000 user, then yes, I can build scans for you. I can build indicators for you. It's not the full turnkey system. It's not going to be the whole trade management and all that stuff, but I can definitely get you, you know, your, your stock in an uptrend. You want it four days down. You want the RSI in this position you want, you know, and I, and I can build all that for you. And then it's up to the trader to sort of, um, execute on it basically. So that's kind of the extent that I, um, build or code for other traders. And I do that often actually. Oh, awesome. Oh, I have one more question from, uh, David, just to find a little bit more um, of what you do outside of trading, Evan. So mm -hmm. he asked for non-trading activities. Do you do anything to enhance your trading or your coding? Mm -hmm. Um, do you do meditation, reading, working out, running, et cetera? Like any, anything, any of the above. Nice. No um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I do, let's see my, my personal obsession, which I don't know that it gives me any benefit to trading, but maybe if I think hard enough, it, maybe it does, maybe that just the general relaxation of it, but I'm a big coffee drinker now, or I like to make and test a lot of different coffee recipes, which is you probably, are in Seattle. That's right. <laughs> I'm, I am in the place for it. Right. And, um, right. I think that probably sounds weird, but there's like lots of, there are lots of different ways you can make coffee and wow, beans. Give us some, man. Uh, hook it up. <laughs> well, 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 what kind of coffee experiments are you doing? So like trading, there are a tremendous amount of variables in when you make coffee. And it is a kind of a maniacal thing to try and get it perfect every time. So all the variables of starting with like the bean, the bean you are choosing, right? So whatever you are choosing to actually purchase, that bean obviously makes probably one of the biggest differences, of course, is just what your, what your coffee is going to taste like. Then you have, well, how fresh is it? And how are you grinding it? What's the grind size that you are actually, you know, melting that bean down to? What are you grinding it down to? What's the actual size of it? Temperature, how, you know, what's the temperature of your, of your coffee when you're actually making it that matters quite a bit. Are you, you know, 180 degrees, 170 degrees on the cooler side, you're going up to 210. That's going to make a big difference. How long you brew for your water makes a huge difference. Um, you know, this is one thing where, you know, a lot of, uh, coffee makers agonize over the types of coffee and how to actually make even keeled coffee. And you can kind of do your own type of water, uh, to, to try and get this exact, but all of these different things. And then you actually have the actual brewing method. So you could do an aero press where you have like that big, you know, kind of suction thing that, you know, you push down and that's an aero press. You could do like a Japanese V60 filter and do like the cone shaped, you know, kind of, uh, extraction method. So there's so many different ways to make it. And there's so many different variables and like, you're always kind of 
as the trader and as like the, 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 the systems in me, I'm like, I'm, I, I actually have a, a little journal. Now I'm really kind of geeking out here of my coffee making and I will log just like a trader would log their trades. I'll actually log like as I'm making the coffee and just trying to be like, okay, that's, that's the recipe or like, that's what I need to go for, but it always changes. And so that's something that I, I enjoy doing actually. Um, yeah, in terms of outside of that, I mean, uh, I got a big old golden retriever, black half half golden, half black lab dog. So I'm usually out with him, walk a lot, and get him some exercise, get me some exercise. So that's always something that I am uh, doing on a daily basis. Probably right after this, in fact, I will be out there with him. And yeah, reading totally. Uh, doing a lot more audiobooks nowadays, so a little bit more on the lazy side of things. But um, I'm still trying to crank down books, podcasts, and all that good stuff to keep me sharp and you know stay up to date. Webinars like this, talking with with Michael, you know, bouncing ideas off of other traders. That's just how you're gonna you know basically stay on top of everything that's going on. So yeah, what you're listening to nowadays? So. Right now, I'm actually on a catching up on podcasts more than I haven't de- uh, jumped into any other books. I'm trying to think of, I got a couple of books on tap. Well, actually, the last one I picked up, actually, this was a physical book, um, which was uh, recommended for me oh, as it? a friend. Oh, let me pull it up here. So it's called Stocks on the Move. So I was oh, yeah. actually talking with um, the Stocks on the New, uh, on the Move by. Uh, Klanau, Andreas Klanau. I haven't read this yet. I've been recommended this multiple times. And um, one of my trading friends that I really respect, he's a brilliant uh, software developer, was talking about it the other day again. And I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get this. Um, so I got that. I don't think they had it on audio or maybe this had a bunch of charts on it. And so that's why I wanted it in physical. So that's one of the trading books, um, podcasts. Yeah. Um, mostly trading related podcasts. I mean, the, the one podcast I've been really enjoying, uh, which is totally outside of trading, which is, I think was the question anyway, was, is called smartless with, um, so it's like three comedians. Yeah. It's, um, it should be like against the law to have three comedians as a podcast because it's just such a funny podcast. Like, it's just, you're just going to crush it when you have three comedians there. It's like, they're made for this type of thing. Um, don't but listen this is, and drive at the same time. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's with, uh, Jason Bateman, Will Arnett and Sean Hayes. So oh my they're, God, um, I have to listen to this. Yeah, <laughs> I love them. Yeah. They're awesome. I love them. If any like arrested development fans like yes. that, you're naturally going to be, you know, um, into them, but yeah, they're super entertaining and I like to just kind of chill out and, you know, after a stressful day of looking at numbers or just thinking about, you know, coding ideas and all that stuff, just to throw in some comedy for an hour is definitely pretty fun. One of the things that you mentioned before, like when you were getting like, and I, and I really love like how uh, detailed you got with the coffee. Uh, I, I, I think that's amazing. Like, like you've got the, uh, is that a book <laughs> or a sign uh, sitting there behind you? Oh yeah, that's a book actually. So that's a great book. Um, so that's Hoffman, James Hoffman that has this book. Uh, so Michael, yeah, is referring to the the World Atlas of Coffee, and it's really like a great um, it's a great like coffee table book because it's got just tons of great photos of just all the different beans and the sources and the soil and like everything about the area and the types of you know notes you're gonna sort of catch off of the the you know the beans and all that good stuff. So yeah, it's a great visual book, but some good history too there. So yeah, that's one um, <laughs> that I enjoy sort of uh, keeping up there. But so like, like, well, when you were mentioning all all that in the the log, like it had me starting to think of, all right, like trading logs too, like, because like everything's kind of related to everything else. And like, what are some of the key, uh, uh, the key uh, data points that you're tracking in a trading log trading journal? Well, what do you find to be most important for traders? Uh, Like aside from uh, like, oh, I'm entering here, I'm exiting there. Like, oh, what else are you keeping track of? Yeah. So this is a great question. And this is, this is absolutely why having a fully quantitative rules-based system is super helpful because of all of the very detailed reports and analytics that I can then measure. And I can just like, 
you know, I, I could theoretically, and again, this is a dangerous thing, but for, you know, purpose, you know, for informational purposes, right. I could say, well, the system just took, you know, 7,000 trades over the past 20 years. What happens if I want to just extend that profit target up just a little bit, right? Maybe I need to get an extra half a percent out of these trades. What does that do to things? And so you can test a lot of these uh, different types of, of metrics in terms of trades. But I mean, at a high level, most important thing I care about is sort of a systems trader is, is, the, is the compound annual growth rate. So just what does the system do on average per year. Um, that is something where I'm always paying attention to because that's obviously, you know, how profitable is it? But then as you know, a, a trader that has been in this for a while, it's not just how much you make, it's how much, you know, you can preserve on the way down. It is your risk adjusted returns. That is what I care most about because I personally cannot stomach a 60% drawdown, 50% drawdown. Like for me, that's just way too much. I can't, I can't see my entire, you know, liquid balance go down 50%. It's just too uncomfortable. So for me, I want to make sure drawdowns are in check. So maximum drawdown and average drawdown, those are two things from a system level I am looking very, very closely at as well. Um, you know, sharp ratio, those things that, 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 you know, that's important. Mar ratio correlations. There's all, all these other things, the win rate, um, how correlated a system is to the S and P 500 is also something I think a lot of traders need to think about. And this is again, something that might not be so exciting for many, but for instance, if you're producing returns like a hundred percent lockstep with the S and P 500, um, why not own the S and P 500 or why not just own like, you know, a levered S and P 500 fund and really get back your time right and again that's a that's a, that's an extreme case but if you know if my systems are only returning what the market's doing and it's correlated with the market uh, why go through all this trouble and you know what i mean so th th those are kind of the the upper level kind of big things that i like to think about um but yeah uh you know outside of the portfolio like whole approach on an individual trade basis win percentage and, and win to loss ratio, those things are, you know, pretty interesting to me. And then just visually going back and inspecting the charts and just seeing, you know, what kind of happened before and after, maybe you can refine things a little bit, you know, closer is kind of the way I like to think about it. Awesome. Alyssa, do we have anything else in the Q and A? Uh I think that's everything on my end. Um, I'm, I'm, my wheels are turning about uh, all the coffee that I need to start uh, <laughs> making besides just cake cups. <laughs> this has been so enlightening. Thank you so much, Evan. I'm going to pass it back to Mike to find out how people can find out more about you. Awesome. Yeah, Evan, tell us how we can find out uh, more about you and everything else that you, you got going on. Awesome. Well, thanks again for having me. This was fun. And uh, I'm pretty easy to find. So at uh, Evan Medeiros, my full name. You can find me on Twitter and stock twits. And the business is The Trade Risk. So thetraderisk.com. You can find social handles on that as well. The Trade Risk, YouTube, we put a lot out there. And um, yeah, check out. There's lots of free education on the site. Most things are free, in fact. And you can you know kind of learn and you know brush up on the automation. I think I have a blog post on you know, a comprehensive sort of automation type of uh, approach to markets and how to take the, the the small steps to get there. So yeah, check, check, check us out there. Amazing. Evan, this has been super enlightening. I really appreciate you giving us the, the time and sharing all your wisdom and knowledge and uh, it's great. Yeah, Thank you so much. Keep us updated about the Evan versus Evan challenge. The Evan versus yeah. Evan challenge. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we'll have to do a, a year anniversary and, and look back at it and see which Evan won. We'll have you back <laughs> on the you go. for that. That'll be fun. <laughs> Put it on the calendar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, uh, Melissa. This was fun. Thank you, Evan. Thank thanks, Evan. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Take care. Much love. Peace out. 
All right, really glad to have reconnected with Evan after all these years. It was really amazing. I really have to step up my coffee game. <laughs> these K cups are not cutting it, but seriously, I did not know all that was involved with automating your trading process. What did you get out of the interview? Yeah, that so much uh, from this interview. The to me, the the biggest thing is that there there's no such thing as wasted time. Right, like it took him ten years to to automate to the point that he's at, and uh, you know, so many of us. When we're on this trading journey could you know you, you hit a roadblock and it's just like ah oh, well, like I, I and feel like you're going back 10 steps but meanwhile that 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 roadblock and then figuring out the way around it that like it, it's not just the way around it that's like getting you closer to the finish line it's also teaching you what not to do he's taking that and building that into the system so that way the system now knows okay here's the roadblock don't hit that and here's the way around it Absolutely. And I think that, yeah, for him, backtesting was key, even though if it wasn't the holy grail, that he looked at 20 plus years of data to really analyze what was working, what wasn't, and what needed. Uh, maybe there was a better way to do it. Yeah, the, the data is super important. The, like so many people too, like uh, get involved in trading or are focused on just the next trade. I actually tweeted about this earlier, that if, they, you know, if you want to be in this game, you shouldn't be thinking about what the next trade result is, right? Like, like if you want consistent profitability, right? Like how long is it going to take me to be profitable? Then you, you shouldn't be focused on one trade, right? Like you're not going to make just one trade. You're going to make years worth of trade. So like focus on a year. Don't focus on one trade. Don't focus on even a month. Like look at the bigger picture and backtesting helps. Evan's great at... Uh, has obviously done all this for himself and uh, it, it shows. Absolutely. And I think one of the things I got out of it is as I am looking at trading that, you know, it may be something that I could be a weak point, uh, could be something down the road that I look to automate. Like if, if my emotions are taking control or I, I'm making bad decisions and I see the, a pattern, maybe that is an area where I can yeah. look to automate so I can still have the fun of trading and, and face that challenge while also having um, something kind of like off my chest where I know like this is taken care of for me so I know that I won't keep making those same mistakes. Yep. Yeah. Play to your strengths uh, and automate the things that are uh, a pain in the ass or that, uh, or that you're not good at, right? Like, like that's kind of like how human evolution and technology have gone, right? Absolutely. So what is one of your uh, key highlights? Leave in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. And for the full list, be sure to check out uh, MaraWealth.com. And uh, yeah, make, make sure you like and subscribe our channel. We'd love to hear from you guys. We're doing this for you so you can continue to educate yourself and get to meet all these amazing traders from around the world and hear about their systems and what works for them so it can help you with your trading yeah that was very well put i'm glad that you threw that in there like, <laughs> like i always forget that uh, that part but yes like That's subscribe all that bike. kind of stuff <laughs> and uh now take everything that you learned today and run with it see you next time bye bye everybody